So welcome. Thank you for coming to our webinar. We're talking about how to construct an exam in Canvas and Blackboard today. Our presenters today are, um, I'm Wendy Teeth from Kent State. Uh, we also have Jennifer Canis from the University of South Florida and Tracy Miller Nobles from Austin Community College. I will ask that when you have a question, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for questions. We'll answer questions at the end. So we're going to get started and we're going to start off, I'm going to give a few general tips. So these tips apply no matter what platform you're using. Um, when you do create an exam, I think um, Jennifer shared this a while ago, that create an exam, wait a few days, take it yourself, and then triple the time it takes you to take it in terms of how do I know how long an exam is for students. That's a really good rule of thumb. Um, use pooled questions. Pooled questions are where the computer will pick from a pool of questions, like one out of three, and then one out of four. So that it picks random questions for each student out of pools. Um, use algorithmic questions. So algorithmic questions, depending on the platform you use, I know Blackboard has algorithmic questions where you can put variables in instead of numbers, so it will generate new questions for each student, different sets of numbers. And then finally, randomize your multiple choice answers just so someone can't go through it and say, well, the answer for that one's always A. So those are general tips that apply no matter what platform you're using. So at this point now, we're going to get into specifics between Canvas and Blackboard and also proctoring tools. So I'm going to turn it over to Tracy um, to begin. Thank you, Wendy. Before we dive into the specifics of Canvas and Blackboard, Jennifer and I are going to share some different tools that we use for proctoring. So at Austin Community College, we have been requiring our students to complete proctored exams. Before those proctored exams took place in the classroom or in the testing center, and now because we've gone to the online component, now our students are completing their proctored exams in an online environment. So the first type of proctoring that we've been using is proctoring that's available through the Blackboard and also available in Canvas. Specifically, we use Respondus Lockdown Browser, which allows the computer to lock down so that students can't access anything other than what you specifically want them to access. So for example, I give a tax exam where students have access to um, the tax tables and some other information. So it locks down their computer from only being able to take the exam and also being able to have items that I've specifically allowed them to have, such as the tax tables. In addition to using the lockdown browser, we also add on the Respondus Monitor. This may or may not be available to you because it's based on institution usage. With the Respondus Monitor, it adds an additional layer to the Respondus Lockdown Browser. And that additional layer is through artificial intelligence monitoring. So what, I, what happens with the Respondus Lockdown Browser with Monitor is that the students have to go through a process of, of having a webcam, turning their webcam on, scanning their environment before they take the exam, and being recorded the entire time they're taking the exam. The um, system monitors their movements to identify if there are any instances where there may be a case of uh, cheating. And then if the faculty member is alerted so that they can then go through and review the recording of the student taking the exam. So this is one of the ways that we do testing for proctoring situations at ACC. In order to do this, what I do is I provide some instructions on what students will have to have. So they have to use the lockdown browser, which they have to install that software onto their computer, and they must have a webcam. The webcam is required for the Respondus Monitor. I provide them with a video that 
identifies for them how to get the software, the lockdown browser, and also the steps to go through for their webcam. In addition, I provide them with guidelines to make sure that they're in a location where they're not interrupted, to make sure they have turned off all their devices, um, to clear their desk and workspace, um, to make sure that they are at their computer there the entire time, because if they leave their computer, it's gonna notify me that they've done that. And so I provide all of that information. The other best practices that I would encourage you to do is to provide a practice scenario for your students to use before they actually take the exam. So the, I have my students go through a practice exam which requires the Respondus Lockdown Browser with webcam to make sure that their first exam experience is going to run smoothly. So this gives them the opportunity to, before they get ready to sit for that first exam, to try out the software, make sure they don't have any kinks, and just make sure that everything is working on their end. And then if it's not, we have time to brainstorm about solutions before the time period of the exam. So here's an example of the feedback that you get when you use this um, system. So this is a listing of students on the left-hand side, and then the computer software automatically detects the ones that you need to look at for priority. You have the ability to review everybody's um, video recording. Uh, I tend to only look at the ones that say high or medium. And so this first one, you can see this was listed as high priority. And so I have the ability to then go through and actually watch that recording. And so you can see that there was 13 times that the student was flagged for what could potentially be um, a possible infraction. And, um, and then it tells you what those fractions were related to. So in this case, the student was kind of moving in and out of the frame of the webcam quite frequently. And so you can see that and watch that on the video. Uh, so this is a really nice tool. Um, I am, we are planning on using this for our summer semester courses also. And um, I have been very happy with um, the process of using Respondus Lockdown Browser with Monitor. Uh, my students have also been very happy with it. And so I would highly recommend this as being a possible option if you're looking for a monitoring software. The other software that we have used at ACC and I've used this semester is um, the Proctor U. And the Proctor U software is also an institutional um, purchase. And in this case, it's a little, it's different than Respondus Monitor because it actually has a live proctor that sits and watches the students while they take their exam. I was really excited about using this as a possible option when we um, started using it this semester, but I have, we have had lots of student issues related to the use of Proctor U. My students have had uh, wait times in order to get, uh, significant wait times, in order to get a proctor to come to begin their exam. I have had issues with students being disconnected in the middle of the exam experience. Um, it has been uh, quite um, an interesting experience with Proctor U. And I suspect that they, these are kinks that are just part of the increased usage um, and I think once they get these kinks worked out, this will be a very valid solution. Um, but it is um, something that we have been experiencing this semester through the use of Proctor U. Now, very similar to what you see with Respondus Monitor, with Proctor U, um, I also provide a detailed guide to students about what it is, how it works, the technical requirements, I give them a test so that they can test out their equipment. Um, one of the differences between Proctor U and Respondus Monitor is that with Proctor U, the student actually, actually has to schedule a specific time that they're going to take the exam. And depending upon the type of agreement your institution has, it could cost your students extra money if they wait to schedule until close to the exam timeframe. 
So I always make sure to share that with my students, encouraging them to schedule ahead of time so they avoid those extra additional fees. With the Respondus Monitor, you actually don't have to um, do any kind of scheduling. The student can take the exam whenever they want to during the testing window, which is another nice feature of Respondus Monitor over the ProctorU experience. The ProctorU experience provides you with, uh, with uh, many of the same details that the, Proc that the Respondus Monitor provides you. I think it also provides you with additional information, some extra information. And so here's that screenshot of where I can see the user, I can actually see the, the information that the, um, the monitor, um, the proctor put in there, I can see any notes that was communicated between the proctor and the student. I can see a recording of the entire um, experience. I can also see a recording of their screen, which you can't get with the Respondus Monitor situation. Um, so I feel that the Proctor U experience provides a lot more detail than the Respondus Monitor does, and it does have that live person. So there is someone that is actually monitoring and interacting with the student during the entire testing um, situation. Um, Jennifer's gonna talk about a proctoring service that she's used, so I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Tracy. So the next proctoring service we wanted to talk about was Proctorio, and we use that at University of South Florida. It's similar to ProctorU and Respondus. I've used Respondus as well. Um, so it does lock the students down. What, what's nice about Proctorio is there's no scheduling needed on the student's behalf. Uh, and I'll show you when we uh, get into some screenshots of my Canvas page, how easy it is to set Proctorio up. Um, it is integrated into our Canvas, and the other nice thing is that you get immediate gradebook results. So as soon as the student finishes the exam, then you can actually go through, and it will, similar to what Tracy showed you for the other uh, monitoring softwares, that it will uh, flag students if they go without certain, you know, go outside certain parameters that you actually have control over setting. So there's several different settings that you can set up, such as behavior, like head or eye movements, or moving around too much, or shuffling things around on their desk. You can also um, set their frame metrics so you can look at things like their screen and are they allowed to open another browser or are they not allowed to open another browser and it can capture all of that. Um, and then there's also certain exam metrics. And um, what I really liked about it, which was helpful for me this time, was there's an option in there where you can make the exam flexible. And what that means is you can set the exam up for your students that everybody's required to take Proctorio, but I know I ran into the case this particular semester that some of my students left campus and then they were unable to, they didn't have a webcam and they were unable to buy one uh, because either the stores were closed or they were locked down or some of my students in other countries, they just had no ability to even have a webcam shipped in. So um, it gave me the ability to, on a one-by-one -one basis, uh, pretty much turn off the Proctoria webcam requirement for those students, and then I just needed to provide them with a password to get into the exam. So it, I really liked that it gave me some flexibility where it wasn't the whole class needed to take Proctorio or not, and I could really just deal with those special instances one at a time, which made it really, really nice. Um, some recommendations I would have, uh, similar to what Tracy was talking about, regardless of what proctoring software you use, then I definitely think you want to provide your your students with a very detailed list of instructions. And I also provided them with the facts and a help page specific to uh, Proctorio, not just how to set it up, but then also some uh, frequently asked questions. I also gave them a setup checklist to make sure that they had everything in place. Uh, I did also have my students take a practice exam and I enabled Proctorio for the practice exams to, so that they could try it and make sure that it was working on their machines. And we ran into a couple of issues, but very, very little uh, issues. I'd say maybe out of my thousand students, I probably had three or four that maybe had some memory issues, but that was about it. And then again, I was able to go in and just modify their individual exam settings 
uh, and that seemed to take care of it. Um, in a normal semester, I would strongly encourage you, if you were going to give online exams and require proctoring, to make sure you incorporate the requirements into your syllabus. And I know you might want to check with your institution because USF has very specific language that they want added to the syllabus that's been approved by general counsel because you're basically recording students in their homes uh, which you're kind of getting into a, a slippery slope there so uh, you might want to check and make sure on a normal semester obviously we had to adapt very quickly this semester but make sure if you plan to use proctoring in the future uh, you definitely want to make sure you include some language in your syllabus and also make sure that your institution doesn't have specific language they're looking for you to put in the syllabus so now I'm going to walk you through Canvas uh, and how I, some different options you can use to set up your exams, different types of questions, uh, and show you some screenshots of what I did this semester. So when you create an exam in Canvas, then it's very, very simple. What you'll do is you'll just go into quizzes, and I'll show you in a second, and you simply add a quiz. And there's lots of different types of questions that you can ask. There's multiple choice and true false, clearly, but there's also in matching. So there's what I would consider lower level on the Bloom's taxonomy type questions, but then there's really some robust questions in there that you can ask. And if you're willing to especially take the time to go back through the exam and kind of hand grade it, so to speak, then there's really opportunities for your students to show a lot of work and, um, uh, kind of take it almost like a regular exam. So I was really, as I really played with some of the features in here, then I was really pleased at the different options. So you can have them fill in the blank, fill in multiple blanks. You can have them do essay questions, which when you think of an essay question, you normally think they're just going to be writing something. But I used some essay questions so that they could show some work on some of the problems that I set up and fill in text boxes. So it kind of helped me. Uh, I made sure that I modified my grades so it would not release the the grades to the student when they submitted the exam to give me the opportunity to go back through and look at some of their work on the exam and maybe look at instances where I might give partial credit on a problem. So now I'm going to show you some screenshots just to give you an idea of what it looks like in Canvas. So to set up a quiz, you can see uh, you go into your, you have your navigation pane here to the left with the different options and you just go into quizzes and then it's as easy as just adding a quiz as you can see there. Um, once you add the quiz, then you'll come up to a details screen and you can see I started an unnamed quiz here, but uh, I'll show you the next few screenshots will kind of show you the different details that you'll fill out. Um, you can put your quiz instructions in here. There's also uh, the ability to link to URLs and pictures and all of that kind of stuff. And then as you kind of move down, uh, then you can see that you can do the quiz type. This was a graded quiz, but your options also include things like a practice quiz. Um, the only uh, caveat I would say about a practice quiz is if you're planning on using a proctoring software, you have to make it a graded quiz for Proctorio to be enabled. So even if it's a practice quiz, so to speak, that's not going to count, you'll have to set it up as a graded quiz if you want Proctorio to work. So just a little uh, note there. Um, you can put it under different assignment groups, whether it's quizzes or assignments, and then you can see all these different options here in the middle where you can shuffle your answers, you set your time limit, uh, allow multiple attempts. I, I enabled that for my practice quiz because I really wanted the students to practice as much as they wanted. Obviously, I didn't have it for the final exam. And then you have a choice here in the middle whether you want to let the students see their quiz responses. Uh, or let them see the correct answers. So again, that's a personal choice as to what you'd want to do. Uh, also, you can see there's a box you can check here where it shows one question at a time. So that's another way that we've talked in other webinars. If you're trying to really cut down on the cheating or academic integrity issues, then that's one of the best practices is you could show one question on the screen at a time for a student if, you, if you're interested in that. And then you can see here under quiz restrictions, then you can require an access code, you can filter the IP addresses, or here you can see that's where you enable Proctorio Secure Exam Proctor. And just by checking that box, then you've got Proctorio enabled on your exam. So very, very simple to set up. 
um, on the next slide, it kind of still is going through your setup of the quiz. And you can see once uh, you click that, then there's a, an access code that's automatically filled in and Proctorio manages that password. So as I was telling you, if for some reason you had a student within a course that you disabled their Proctorio requirement, then this actual password will appear for that student and you just need to give the student the password so that then they can take the they still can't get into the exam without that password. And then this was also a really nice feature. Usually your default is going to be assigned to everyone, but I did have a few students that had to take the exams at alternate times. So under that assign box, then you do have the ability to assign certain um, exam dates and times to certain students. So that made it really nice rather than worrying about having to reopen the exam for everyone, then I could just put certain settings in there for specific students. But again, most of the time the default will just be you're assigning it to everyone. Um, so next, um, as far as we can move down, so activating Proctorio in your course, once you set it up on the quiz, you do need to make sure within your course in Canvas you've activated Proctorio, and that's very simple as well. Uh, you can see under your navigation pane here that usually the last um, little button here is settings and once you click on settings what you'll want to do is go down below uh, kind of where it says down at the bottom drag items here to hide them from students and this secure exam proctor that you see in the middle of the page here that normally is down below so you will have to physically drag that up uh, into the course navigation panel so, and save it so that then that will be what enables Proctorio within your course. So you'll need to make sure you do that. Um, to build your quiz, once you move off the details pane and go into questions, and there's lots of different ways that you can build your quiz. So we've got new question, new question group, and find questions. So I'm going to kind of walk you through what each one of those looks like. And you can also see that Proctorio settings have now been enabled on my quiz. So you can see that right after the questions tab. And under here, you can click in here if you'd like, and that's where you can customize some of your settings. Like, for instance, if you're fine with, I don't know why you might have a group exam, but let's say it's a group exam. So if you're fine with more than one face in the screen, then you can actually set Proctorio to allow more than one head uh, on the camera at a time. And there's all sorts of different things that you can set. You can set up an online calculator, different things you can set up for the students, um, depending on what, you, what your needs are. But let's walk through some different types of questions. So the first one is adding a new question, that first button. And when you do that, you can see all these different choices come up. So your first few, multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank, those are kind of lower on Bloom's taxonomy. But as you can see, you have lots of different choices here. And then you can fill in different types of questions, which I'll show you what some of those looks like in a minute. Um, my next screen here is add a question group. So the first, the screen we just showed was just adding a new question. So you're adding question by question into your exam. Uh, but if you add a new question group, what I really like about that is if you actually have taken some time and built some question banks into your, uh, into your course, uh, then kind of what Wendy was saying as far as having it go out to pooled questions, then you can kind of set up your question groups where when you hit link to a question bank, then you can tell that group, okay, I want five questions out of this question bank, and you may have 50 different questions in there. So pick five out of this one, five out of this one, five out of that one. So setting up the test, the, the question banks themselves can be kind of cumbersome, but once you have those ready, then it makes it really, really nice to create a randomized exam for your students and very, very easy. So this screenshot is when you actually click on that link to a question bank and you can see that I had um, several here and you can also click on the top right there to view course question banks. But what I had done for my courses is when I do some multiple choice questions, I always like to have some that test them on the conceptual parts of the chapter. And then I always like to have some questions that require them to do some computations that are a little harder. Um, so when I set my test banks up, I named them that way. So then it makes it very easy for me to go in and just grab certain questions from certain types of questions group. And they're still all multiple choice. 
And you, it, you can see here, if you just scroll down, then you would see all the different test banks you have to select from. So, you know, in our quick response here to online, um, you might not have test banks set up, but it might be something that you want to think about in the future if you're thinking about either having some online quizzes or you just want to be prepared in case you may be teaching more classes online in the future. So it's a really nice way to, once you put in the time, to really create some pretty rigorous exams very quickly and get them set up for your students. Um, here, some other types of questions that you might not realize you can use. I think we always kind of think we have to default to multiple choice and true false, but there's really a lot of other nice questions. So you can see here, I did pull out some questions from my final exam to show you. So this first one, I did a fill in the blank, and this was a bonds question for my financial accounting course, where the first thing I asked them to do is to um, calculate what the cash interest payments would be, but I actually had them fill in the blank and I wanted them to show their work. So that was one possibility. And then what I did was I had them set up from that bond question. There was a couple more questions like solve for the issue price of the bond and things like that. But then I actually set up an amortization schedule within um, within my test question, and it was very, very simple. You can see it's a fill in multiple blanks type of question. And the way I set up this little table here is just clicking right under your bold uh, little icon there right below there is a table. So I just set up a table and kind of set it up for the students. But then you can see here I have number one, number two, number three. And what you do is you pretty much when you put or name one of those cells and put those brackets around it, that's telling Canvas that they need an answer in there. And then you can see what I did was then I defined the answer. So for number one, for example, the answer was 284.98. 88, but I also had a possible answer with a dollar sign just in case they put it in there. Now, of course, I told them not to put the dollar sign in there, but we know our students don't always read, so I still put it in there. But again, this whole problem was worth 13 points to the students, and I still modified my grades at the end so that I muted the grades so the students would not see, the, see their answers, and I could go back and look at this chart because obviously if their book value of the bond was a dollar or two off, then some of their other answers in here would also be a dollar or two off, and it may mark them wrong, but I would still give them credit for those. So it gives me the opportunity to, to ask a little bit more of a rigorous question, ask them to do some more work, and gives me the ability to maybe evaluate their work and give them some partial uh, credit. Um, the next type of question is a text box for instructions. Um, so here, you can have a question set up where it's no points, but you're just giving them instructions. It's just text. So I did that. Like, for instance, here's some time value money problems. And I had a link out to the present value and future value factor tables that I required them to use. Um, you can also do essay questions, which um, I did specifically for certain problems that I wanted them to type in their work as to how they got the answer. So rather than just do a multiple choice, I set it up as an essay question. So they had to kind of set up those formulas for me. And then there's also multiple drop downs, which is similar to the chart that I just showed you. But here, when the student is actually within the exam, like this was a journal entry they needed to do for stock, then they could click on, you know, the first little cell here, name one, and they had a choice between different um, accounts. And then you just set up the correct answer. So I gave them several different accounts and they had to choose the correct one. So a little bit faster grading if you give them multiple drop downs as opposed to making them write in the numbers. So it really just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I also had a file upload question at the end of my exam. I gave them a statement of cash flows that they needed to do. So I gave them the opportunity if they wanted to show any work on a separate sheet of paper that they could upload that at the end. So depending on um, your feelings on academic integrity, I was more interested in seeing their work, um, but you can build it so that they upload it right into the exam. So just some ideas of what you can do rather than just stick with uh, good old multiple choice. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tracy and she'll talk to you a little bit about Blackboard. Thank you, Jennifer. So let's talk about Blackboard now. Um, I use the learning management system that I use is Blackboard. And I do a lot of the same things that Jennifer does. And I'm going to talk specifically about two different ways that I create exams using the Blackboard learning management system. 
So the first option that I use to create exams is to simply use the test tool in Blackboard. The types of questions that I use are multiple choice and short answer um, questions. And specifically, I use the short answer for students to do workout problems and also to answer essay questions. I do utilize random blocks for all of the multiple choice questions. And so every student gets a different exam um, based upon the random blocks that I have set up. So if you are going to create a test in Blackboard using the test tool, then you will go into the content area and you'll click on assessment and then you'll select the test item. You'll then go to create a new test. Um, you also have the ability to add an existing test or use a test from another section. So you can do that in this space also. But if you're creating a new test from scratch, you're simply gonna click create new test and then hit submit. Then we'll have the opportunity to type in the name of the test, any description that you want to share with the students, any instructions that you have for the students, all of that can be added in this test information area. Now we're ready to go through and create the actual test. And like Jennifer showed you in Canvas, Blackboard also has a variety of different options. So Wendy referred earlier to the algorithmic options, which are those calculated formula and calculated numeric. We also have essay options. We have the ability for students to uh, upload a file. We have uh, matching, multiple answer, multiple choice, short answer, true, false, a lot of different options for you to create using um, when you're building your exams. The other thing is that you can also create those random blocks that I utilize. Um, so I use the random blocks set setting a lot, which allows me to go through and identify, I usually do it by learning objective, this specific learning objective, and I want each student to be given X number of questions out of this learning objective. One way to ensure that your test um, maintains some academic integrity um, so that every student has a different exam. The other option, and this is the one I use more frequently to create exams um, that are going to be deployed in Blackboard, is to use the Respondus software. And the reason why I really like this option is because I can create the test in a Word document and then I can import that Word document into Respondus, and then Respondus will um, import that into the Blackboard course. So that's why, I that's why I usually create the exam in Respondus and then link it over to Blackboard. The other thing I like about this is that I find it easier to load in the publisher test banks into Respondus, and so I can load in the publisher test banks into Respondus, and then I can build exams directly from the Respondus software using the publisher test banks. The other thing that I really value in Respondus, because um, before COVID, I had online and face-to-face -face classes. And so respond, building the exams in Respondus gave me a nice print option. So students who took the exam uh, via paper and pencil, I didn't have to create two different exams. There's really no nice print feature in Blackboard when it comes to your exams. But if I created it in Respondus, I could send the electronic version to Blackboard. And I also had a print version that I could print directly from the Respondus software. So if you're not familiar with the Respondus software, um, here's kind of the opening screen of what it looks like in Respondus. And you can see there's just a really quick link right there where you can get connected to the different test banks. Um, you'll have to fill out a form that requests the test banks that you want. And after you fill out that form, it usually takes 24 to 48 hours for you to get access to the test banks that you're requesting. And then there's that import questions feature where you can basically create an exam from a Word document 
um, providing the solutions and everything in that Word document and take that Word document, import it directly into Respondus, and then it will be directly linked to Blackboard. So for those of you who are transitioning to an online environment, if you already have exams created in Word, this is a great option for you to use Respondus software, import your exams you've already created into Respondus, and then link the exams to Blackboard. So the linking process in Blackboard is, is really, really easy, and I'll show you that in just a second. You can, in Respondus, do all the same things that you can do in Blackboard. So you can utilize those random blocks, um, like I'm demonstrating here, where I have a series of different questions, and I'm saying, um, you know, here's the set, and here's the number of questions to select from this set of questions. And then once you get the exam as you want it, then you're just gonna go through publishing the exam to Blackboard. And there's a publish wizard that works very well where you can say, I want to publish this exam to these different sections that I have. And so you can send the exam to multiple sections and it is just no problem at all. So really recommend the use of Respondus software um, to utilize um, and building exams in and then linking it over to Blackboard. It um, makes the process really, really nicely, especially if you already have uh, Word document exams created. So that's our um, coverage for today about how to create exams in Canvas and Blackboard. And some of us are done with the semester, but I'm not quite yet done. And so I am hoping that I make it to the end of the semester. And hopefully if you're not done yet either, you um, may feel like this also, but I do know that we will all make it to the end of the semester. Um, and as you're thinking about getting ready for the next semester, or maybe you're watching this recording at a later time, uh, please follow our blog, accountingisanalytics.com. We are providing recordings of all the webinars that we have done on our blog. And we also provide some extra resources on there specifically related to data analytics and introductory accounting. And anytime we post information, if you follow our blog, you'll get an announcement about that. So Wendy, I'm gonna pass it over to you to wrap us up. Okay, great, thank you. So um, we do have another webinar scheduled. This one's pretty exciting. I'm taking the lead on this next one we have. Um, how to use Microsoft Teams in education. I know a lot of us have um, Microsoft Teams we're using, but they actually have an education team, a class team that you can create. And I'm using Teams in my own class, so we're going to be talking about that. You can get a look at that and see if that's something you might be interested in moving to. Um, it is fascinating since we all are using, many of us are using Teams at work. It's interesting to implement it in the classroom. Um, so also we've had some other webinar recordings online um, on our website. So like online office hours, options for recording videos, ways to write on your screen, strategies for giving exams online. So we have a bunch and go to accountingisanalytics.com. And then that leads us to any questions we have. And I do see that there is one question here right away. Um, how do you, so we'll start with Tracy and then give it over to Jennifer. Tracy, how do you respond to the infractions that are flagged by the proctoring service? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you saw, um, you know, in ProctorU and also in Respondus Monitor, um, we get those that detailed information about any susceptible issue, any issues that there might be. Um, so like, for example, the one that I showed where the student was marked as high priority. Um, if for some reason, her video camera was not it was identifying that she was out of the frame when she really wasn't out of the frame. So that was an issue just with the software not acting correctly, I flagging her for something that was not occurring. And so I was able to look through that and there was no issue there. So I didn't have to respond to that issue at all, which is really fabulous. 
Um, in, I have had situations um, where I have had to respond to those issues. And so then I have to begin the process of doing what we do at my college when we have situations of scholastic dishonesty. And so, you know, that begins by me sending an email to the student, notifying them that I believe there was an instance of scholastic dishonesty, um, setting up a meeting with the student. Um, and the great thing about this process is that, you know, I have a recorded video of what actually took place. So I can show them the video, we can talk through that process, and then, you know, if they need to, if they decide they're going to appeal it, then they, we begin the appeals process. Um, so I actually like handling scholastic dishonesty situations better in this type of an environment because I have a recording of what actually happened. Um, you know, so often in the classroom, it's a matter of kind of he, you know, they said this and you said this, and it's a matter of where does that come down in the middle, but this, this software, these software systems provide you with a really nice um, capability of backing up your um, suspicions. So, so that's how I handle it. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I would say that I handle it pretty much um, very similarly. I'll also say that normally what I try to do is a couple of things to try to prevent them from wanting to cheat to begin with. Um, the practice exam, I would suggest making it even harder than the regular exam <laughs> because with the practice exam, if you scare them, what I kind of told my students is, look, take the practice exam. You need to study just like you would for a regular exam. Uh, it's still going to have the same amount of rigor and you do not have time to be looking up answers or trying to text someone. So A, you're being recorded and it will flag you. And, we're, and I told my students that we're watching every single video. Um, was a little fib there. Probably we're only, you know, we're only looking at the ones that are maybe flagged. Um, but I told the students we're going to watch every single video regardless to just make sure there's no issues. Uh, and I can tell you that I think, I think if you set the tone up front that you're not, uh, you're not going to be lenient on the webcams and that you're going to be watching, then I think it really tends to cut down on probably 95% of it because the students um, were more panicked, I think, about proctorio and being flagged than they were the actual exam. So, you know, I just made it very clear to them to state their name, show their student ID. Um, I did allow them to have a scrap sheet of paper. So I said anything, you know, you need to show your desk and that one sheet of scrap paper, you need to flip it on the front and the back. And I made it very, very clear what they were allowed to have and not have uh, and told them that we would be looking at every single video, um, regardless of whether they they were flagged, but we would look at the flagged ones first. So I would kind of um, maybe encourage them to just study for the exam and take it. And if the practice exam is harder, then they kind of know that they're not going to have a whole lot of time to be looking up a bunch of answers. And then honestly, I think my final exam was slightly easier. So if they overstudied, then they were in good shape. Um, so I, I like a lot of preventative measures or I guess kind of cutting off the problem before it even begins. But if you do suspect an academic integrity issue, I think that the monitoring softwares have, you know, absolutely great capabilities to, for you to watch that video. And it does really help you back up your claim if you have, uh, if you suspect an academic integrity violation. So I agree with Tracy 100% on that. Okay, we have another question here, and this one relates to, um, I know at least Proctorio, but <clears throat> what, do you ever have students push back about Proctorio specifically? Because Proctorio, um, when you install Proctorio as a student, it gives Proctorio access to your entire computer. Do you ever have students push back, and how do you deal with that? Start with you, Tracy. So I'll specifically talk about it from ProctorU perspective, um, not because I haven't used Proctorio, but I'll talk about it from ProctorU perspective. So I have had some students that have had security issues with um, the ProctorU having remote, the monitor, the, the proctor at ProctorU having remote access to their computer and being able to, because they actually take control of the student's computer 
briefly to um, solve issues, to enter passwords, et cetera. And so I have had students who have had issues with that. Um, this semester, how we handled it was that I had one student who refused to take the exams due to that issue. And so I, I just had to give the student an incomplete because there was no other option to get around that. And so that's what ended up happening. For the summer semester, because we're not gonna be caught off guard about this, um, we're including in the course notes that the students um, have to use the proctoring service in order to take this exam. So we're letting students know upfront that this is going to be a requirement that's part of taking the exam. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I agree, Tracy. Um, actually, I have about a thousand students and I didn't have a single student complain to me about having to take their exams using Proctorio. Um, I know, of course, all of their other classes were requiring it, so we're in kind of a unique situation and unique times, but I didn't have a single student give me pushback. Now, I had a couple of students that when they took the practice exam, they had memory issues or something like that, so we dealt with those on a case-by-case -case basis, but none of them complained about um, having to take their exams on Proctorio. But I also agree with Tracy, in a normal semester, it's imperative you have it in the syllabus and tell them if they're taking that course on, you know, if they're taking your course online, then the exams will be given using ProctorU or Proctorio um, and make sure that there's very specific language in your syllabus telling them that that's what's gonna happen. Um, so I think if you set that expectation up front, then you can deal with those issues as they occur. But I didn't have anybody give me a hard time with it, surprisingly. They were nervous about it and they were worried about it because they were worried about being flagged. But as far as them telling me they, they were refusing to take or, you know, to download uh, Proctorio, then I didn't have that at all. I guess they're just more okay. afraid of me or something than Tracy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I doubt okay. it. Okay. <laughs> well, well. Thank you. And I think that we are at the end of our time. So thank you for joining us and hang in there. We're almost done with the semester. Thank you. Thank you.